I leave the screensaver on uh, because as a last resort, it is a way to be reminded if I have talked too long uh, and, and need to be reminded to uh, finally advance a slide. Uh, so I was, uh, I was uh, when I, uh, the decision was made that I would come speak, and I'm very excited to be here. Uh, it, it's true that it was meeting uh, many of you that inspired me to quit my IT job at Georgia Tech. I wasn't even really the web guy. The web guy wrote PHP, and I could never convince him otherwise. Um, uh, I, I, I did back-end programming, and it was meeting many of you that inspired me to think of the world of small consultancies and of self-employed people, uh, because after meeting the Plone community, uh, oh, this will sound bad, I don't want to say, once I met them, I was like, oh, well, I can do that. <laughs> but, but I mean that in the sense that, you know, going to PyCon, there's a lot of people, most of them worked at companies or worked at universities or stuff like that, and, and Plone co conferences were just so thick with independent consultants, with people in little, uh, roles they had crafted and created for themselves that it was really uh, inspirational. And even though uh, Georgia Tech, well, they didn't keep using clone for long, and I didn't stay at Georgia Tech uh, for, for more than a year, you, you inspired me right out of a job. <laughs> um, and then the international economy collapsed six weeks later, so <laughs> that was interesting timing. Um, but I, um, what was I talking about? Now I'm thinking about 2009 and the housing crisis. Um, but, but anyway, it was, uh, even though I didn't wind up then coming to a lot more Plone conferences because my work and my profession went in different directions, I am so happy to be back and to see uh, familiar faces and, and faces that are new. Uh, the, uh, they asked, I, I kind of said, well, what, what are some topics I could, could um, uh, cover? And it was suggested I talk about where Python is at with the web right now, where someone outside the Python world looking in uh, might see things going, and so um, uh, these are my thoughts. I really enjoyed several years ago the movie The Social Network. How many people here have uh, seen it? Uh, about half of you. I was startled, like when, when, when I heard they're making a Facebook movie. I was like, this is going to be horrible. This is going to be, you know, like any of those tie-in movies to something that's becoming really big, so oh, let's have a movie about that. Um, and I was startled by how good the writing was, the dialogue, the characters, just the snark and intelligence flying back and forth as these uh, former uh, Harvard students who had been uh, at Harvard at the same time as the inventor of um, Facebook tried to sue him to get part of the huge fortune that was amassing as, as Facebook took off. Um, and one line in it has stuck, out, uh, has stuck with me and, and plays in my head now and then. The line, we don't even know what it is yet. Um, one of the business partners, uh, Facebook is taking off. It now has a few hundred users. It's being used at like several universities. And so the business partner, the other kid who's starting it up with him, immediately is like, it's time to cash in. It's time to do pop-up ads. Anyone here remember pop-up ads? <laughs> so, like, it's early 2000s, and he's like, it's time. We have, like, a 1,000 users. Let's do pop-up ads. And uh, Mark Zuckerberg pushes back and is like, no, we're not going to monetize this yet. People use the Facebook because it's cool. Pop-up ads are not cool. <laughs> users are fickle. College kids will go to another site next week if we start doing pop-up ads. He said it's not time yet to declare ourselves finished and just try to monetize because, I mean, what is the Facebook? We don't even know what it is yet. Um, and that phrase has really stuck with me because of how often we will get a new technology and obviously, in retrospect, have no idea what it is yet have no idea how we're supposed to be using it, have no sense, at least initially, of the patterns and the practices which will make the technology great. 
Sometimes we invent something, but we don't even know what it is yet. In this case, the web and Python, we had two technologies of which that was true. Think of the web and Python in the late 90s. Not a lot of Python code written in 97 or 98 looked like modern, careful, PEP8, standard Python code like we would write today. Many of the idioms we use didn't even exist yet. Iteration was still in its infancy. Uh, context managers, the finally clause, didn't even exist yet. The web was also in its infancy. Does anyone remember having to add uh, attributes to your elements in HTML that just to get colors and fonts? Does anyone remember the blink tag? <laughs> Will any of you admit to having used it? <laughs> the web was in its infancy. We didn't even know what it was yet. We didn't realize what it would become. Python was still very young, and we didn't know what it would become. And these two technologies, neither of them mature, neither of them quite sensible yet, got to collide and encounter and start creating ideas as the sharp edges and nice features of Python and the sharp edges and nice features of the web began to, through our work, negotiate with each other to find out how Python could best be plugged into the web. So what does Python offer? What was that exciting list, not of features, that's a much longer list, but what were the properties Python had that got us inside excited back when we started? The big things I noticed back when it was first being touted, when its competitors were things like awk and Perl and C and C++ and then later Java, uh, the things that really set Python apart as things that you couldn't do in the same way in other languages were reflection, the fact that it was object-oriented, the fact that it was dynamic, and the fact that it was kind of in its design radically simple. Reflection is the idea that your program can look at itself as in a mirror. Your program, for the first time when reflection was invented, programs could kind of look at themselves in the mirror. I shouldn't say that the very first programs ever written in assembly language could, if they wanted, look at themselves. The same operations that would let them read from normal memory locations could let them see their own code or modify it if they wanted, or even accidentally modify it even if they didn't want to. Um, but then programming languages had come along like Algol and C, and uh, they didn't let you list all of the functions from a particular file or module. They didn't let your program look at its own modules and classes and functions and uh, find things out about them or auto-discover them. Python was very exciting because it provided built-in facilities that let you uh, get a hold of objects and ask about them. Well, I've, I've been, you know, someone's give, opened this module. What's inside of it? There's a class, what are its methods? A program could introspect and make decisions on the fly based on what an, another piece of code had inside of it. And that immediately, with the very, one of the very first web frameworks of the 2000s, uh, Cherry Pie, uh, was, was used to register views. Wouldn't it be horrible if you wrote a website with uh, 10 or 20 views to have to then go through and register them all with the framework? That would be awful. <laughs> so Cherry Pie had you put your views in a class and set a little attribute called exposed on them. And then Cherry Pie, inside of its code, could use that introspection logic in order to loop through all of the methods and find which ones you had intended to make views. It eliminated boilerplate and repetition. Python was also object-oriented and like full throat multiple inheritance style object orientation. Uh, now I should distinguish object-based languages. Uh, that's just a um, uh, language that lets you define and create objects. I create a thread object. I don't have to worry about its internal details. I should distinguish that from object orientation where you add features, you reuse code by, in this case, and in 
threading, because it's old 1990s code, did this was its original way. It used to be that if you were writing a thread, you didn't give it some function to run. That, that wouldn't be 1990s Python. You instead subclassed the threading.thread uh, class in order to create one whose run method did what you wanted instead of what the default thread run method did, which I, I think was originally nothing. Um, and I know you're looking at this and you're just horrified because writing a new method in an existing class is like one of the worst kinds of coupling there is between code. You're receiving this uh, uh, self uh, 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 that is the whole object you're part of. You are writing a method that is a sibling to all of these other methods that you didn't write, you don't understand, and yet you're expected to know how to behave responsibly and to use this object you're now part of in ways that won't break as new versions of that object come out in the future. But subclassing, it was the thing in the 90s. Everyone wanted to subclass, and uh, it was Thus, a big selling point for Python that not only did it point, uh, support bog standard objects that uh, are very simple, but that it let you subclass and subclass and subclass to build up very uh, complicated objects. Object oriented, you get invited to write new methods for existing classes. And because you're not writing a plain function, it eats a whole level of indentation. That's a different story though. But it was a big popular selling point of Python. All right, third, Python was very dynamic. Code objects, modules, classes, and functions were first class objects you could look at and put in lists and put in dictionaries, and they could change at runtime. For example, you might think this little module that I've written here would raise an error when I call my view. What error would it raise? Name error. There's nothing in this module called request. Well, guess what? There was a web framework, it still exists today, that decided that it would just let you use request and response and things like that because before calling your views, it injects request as a new global at the top level of each of your web modules because otherwise we might have to import something. And that would be terrible because we'd know where it came from and how it worked. <laughs> I won't name the web framework, but that was the thinking that was, was happening in the 90s and early 2000s. In a dynamic language, you can wind up with code and objects that don't even exist in your raw source code. Django, originally, you would write configuration for some classes you wanted, and it would, in memory, build and create new modules full of classes it had generated from your configuration. That was all torn out before they went 1.0, but in early versions of Django, it was a code generator. You would run import and name a module that did not exist, that was not a PY file on your disk, and that none of your debugging tools could find. <sighs> of course, then later, the question, once we had the Zen of Python and started thinking about it a lot, question came up, does that make your code more readable? You know, having code that doesn't actually exist on the hard drive. And uh, uh, the answer, as I'm kind of uh, suggesting, is no. Finally, Python was famous because it was simple. We don't have a case statement, a switch statement, even though everyone wants one, because Guido says, you know, let's just use if and if else. It's simple. We don't have a do-while loop, even though C and C++ and Java all have do-while loops. Why? Well, Guido said you can get the same thing done with a while loop, and having just one kind of loop is simpler. Over and over again, Guido, in a blog post he did on Python's design philosophy, quoted Einstein. He tried to be guided by the, by the idea, things should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. I would argue this has wound up being PyCon's superpower, uh, is that it has those other features for those cases where you really need them. But the thing that makes every .py file that you write or can make it a delight is that simplicity. Recently, there was a blog post, Choose Boring Technology, someone who's been at several startups, uh, in particular helped start Etsy, 
he said that every company gets about three innovation tokens. I mean, later when they become really big, they get more. But essentially, as a startup, you can do about three novel things without falling over. He said, your little startup decides it's going to use MongoDB. You've just used up one of your innovation tokens. <laughs> You've decided that you're going to use a brand new uh, framework for doing a, a, you know, a database um, multiplexing between different databases. You've just used up another innovation token. He says, choose boring technology. Only choose strategically where you're going to do something adventuresome or complicated. What's boring? MySQL is boring. Postgres is boring. PHP is boring. Python is boring. So he builds startups on these technologies and succeeds. And so the, um, it really wound up that we thought all of these features would come into play in every .p file, .py file we wrote for the web. But it really was the fact that Python is just simple, that its syntax is simple. You don't have to hold a lot in your head to understand the code that has wound up being the drawing feature that has slowly over time begun to really grow the community to be a very large one. So what are the big web, web frameworks today? Just off the top of my head, I thought of Django, Flask, Bottle, Pyramid, and I know Morpath is kind of obscure, but you know, it's more time. <laughs> So it was kind of on my mental list of something that had come out recently that I should look at. And I was happy to see, by the way, when I looked up Python web frameworks and was sent to one of those list of Python web frameworks websites, it was actually the same five, exactly the same five that a, a, a major author who has a book out had, had made just sort of off, the, I don't know if it was off the top of his head, but his research had led to this same list. I went and as a kind of very rough proxy of popularity among developers on GitHub, I looked at the number of stars. And it was about what you would expect from number of talks at conferences and things like that. Flask and Django are at about an order of magnitude uh, more popularity than Bottle and Pyramid, and maybe two orders of magnitude uh, more popular than newer or boutique solutions like uh, Morpath. But you know what? I found out my mental list had some gaps. Those are not the complete list of top five web frameworks at the moment. I had completely forgotten about web.py, web2py, and just for fun, I went ahead and threw in cherry pie at the bottom, though as you can see, it does fall off the end of that list that I was creating. Um, out on the edges of the Python world, those solutions have, uh, are still there and are still operating and still have users and are active projects. What do the top frameworks have in common? Uh, Flask and Django, looking at all the different features and different approaches. Some of the reason they're there is a historical accident and um, has to just do with the history when things came out, how they were touted. But are there any features they have in common? I would say they have in common that views are just plain functions. Newcomers to Python don't have to know what a class is to write their first view, hit reload, and see a web page. They offer explicit registration. You do not hand them your module and have them run through it magically auto-discovering all of your views. Instead, each view is marked with a decorator. In fact, I think one of the frameworks even calls it view. Uh, you somehow or other, with a decorator or by listing it in a list of views that you keep, you explicitly register. There's no invisible magic. You can see where you're linking the view to the web framework. Both of them let you start very small. You can start with a single function and begin learning and growing from there, especially if you're a new programmer. And both of them aim for simplicity where they believed it was possible without compromising features. Today, I would say Django stands as Python's default kind of first web framework that a person tries when they're getting into the Python community. It, um, it, it, did you notice, by the way, on the list of um, frameworks, did you notice that actually Flask was above Django in the number of stars on GitHub? That's amazing if you think about, say, the number of Flask events worldwide 
in a given month with the number of Django events worldwide in a month. But Django, popular among the newcomer, popular among the amateur uh, web developer, that doesn't necessarily translate into GitHub stars, which tends to be the plugged in, connected professional developer who has a GitHub account. Uh, so Django, slightly less popular in number of stars on uh, GitHub, nonetheless is Python's kind of default first framework that someone tries out. It has, without you having to go learn ecosystems you don't even understand yet, has a built-in ORM. So you can get your data saved uh, to a database uh, and, and learn what an ORM is before hopefully you then later as a more mature web programmer have opinions about ORMs and start wanting to select your own. It gives you an admin interface connected to the ORM, which means that your data is from the first moment visible. I cannot emphasize enough how much the learner, how much the person who doesn't get thoroughly know a technology needs to have things visible, needs to have things explicit, as the Zen of Python would say. Python is a good language because your lists and dictionaries, your data structures that in so many other languages are behind the scenes, uh, have wrappers, these pretty, uh, you can just print them to the screen and see what you've stored in uh, a dictionary. In the same way, the Django admin interface lets you just look. So you set up your first form, you try creating a blog post. Did it work? Was an object created? You just head over to the admin interface and you see whether a new row has appeared in the list of blog post uh, entries in the database. Very important for the beginner. Now finally, it does have a forms library. I know what you're thinking, a forms library? That might involve classes. They might ask you to inherit from something. It might involve introspection. It might involve reflection and looking at your forms uh, class you've just made to find the fields inside. It might involve all of the magic that I was just uh, describing and that a lot of Python libraries try to avoid. But good programmers don't avoid uh, complexity when it solves an important problem and when it rescues the programmer from even greater uh, complexity. It does involve a bit of a risk. Anyone here ever read about multi-trailer system control? Anyone here ever backed up a vehicle with a trailer attached? Anyone ever had that trailer go in a direction you weren't expecting? <laughs> Multi-trailer systems are where you have a rig and several trailers behind it. And this, uh, people who do neural networks and, and feedback control systems, this is a famous problem to try getting like a new student in robotics. Can you make the robot back up the toy truck and the toy truck falls over and you laugh at the student and it's great. <laughs> Uh, and as you can imagine, it gets harder and harder. They now, there are papers out you can find online where they've gone to three trailers and even four trailers. So you sit there, you turn the wheel, and how is the fourth trailer going to react as you start backing up? They're, they're building and testing algorithms that can think through how to turn the wheel so that the, all of the trailers straighten out as you go backwards instead of all jackknifing. Something like a forms library is very much like a trailer you're trying to back up. <laughs> you're given a set of knobs you can control. Magic happens and a form appears on the web. If you want that form to go in a slightly different direction, it's not always obvious what knob you can control in the inputs to the form library that will suitably change the outputs that you're looking at on the screen. Uh, Ian Bicking. Anyone remember him? Oh. I hear he does stuff other than Python now. He was, uh, and, and, and is probably doing it very well. Remember that he would never use a forms library, even wrote a whole blog po post about how he just couldn't stand them. Because, yes, he didn't have to write the label field, label field, label field correctly when writing the HTML of a form, but then the moment that you your client says, well, that's a really long list of radio buttons. Can you split it into two columns that are alphabetized? Well, where's the knob for that on the typical forms library? And so he just wouldn't touch them uh, because of this problem, the control problem. Um, but the trade-off, you yield some control, might be harder to get specific tweaks made, 
but you get features back instead. The forms library in Django gives the brand new web developer automatic validation. Uh, it will refill the form. You know, it's very cruel for a user to fill out a form. There's an error for, them to, for you to give them a blank form back to try again with. Yet that's what the web does by default. You have to know uh, how to fill in all of the values you've gotten back, back into the form without creating Unicode errors or weird encoding artifacts in the ver uh, text in the form that comes back. Uh, and cross-site scripting protection is also just solved for you. Uh, so a whole class of vulnerabilities that the beginning web developer cannot understand yet. Like if you explain it to them, they just look at you blankly. It makes no sense cross-site scripting until you know quite a bit about security in the web. So Django just bakes in protection against it. And they judge, and their users judge, that that's worth the subclassing and the introspection and the lack of uh, control, the fact that you're now guiding uh, trailers uh, as you back up, uh, because of these huge benefits that otherwise make forms almost unusable and unworkable for people in their first month, let's say, as a web developer. There's so much to understand to get that round trip correct. Flask has kind of settled in as the go-to second framework. Once you kind of understand the moving pieces and are wanting to take some more control, it's the simpler, more slimmed down solution that will let you do that. And then further down are the more boutique solutions that have other varieties of form library or not, ORM or not, transaction control or not, but that often as you go down the list are beginning to become interesting variations on or elaborations of basic patterns that you've already learned in your, your starting web framework. Given that uh, uh, you know, sort of landscape, there's a bigger question. Will people keep writing Python for the web? Because, as you might have heard, we now have competition. There's a language out there, JavaScript. Do you guys don't still use uh, KSS, do you? <laughs> which was an, a last ditch attempt to never ever have to write any JavaScript. Uh, it's a language that is ubiquitous. It's in every web browser. It's on your mobile phone. Uh, far easier to get to. Any, any kid that wants to try out JavaScript, can, you can just show them how to open the little prompt. It has an interactive prompt with command line editing in your web browser. Um, and it's ubiquitous. Web developers already know it because they have to write it on the front end. And with the recent development of Node.js, they got the V8 JavaScript engine and you can run it on the server and have command line programs that use JavaScript. You can now run web servers that are written in JavaScript the same way you'd write a .py file and have it run on your server. And JavaScript is at the moment a much cleaner story when looked at from outside. Python, are you going to use Python 2 or Python 3? And why are there two versions of your language? And why aren't they compatible? And why hasn't everyone moved if the new one is so good? In Python, are you going to choose to be compatible with everything and be slow on CPython? Or are you going to use our fast, extraordinary, jitted, uh, version PyPy and not be able to import any of the normal modules you use because they're written in C. These are showstoppers for some people considering Python as a language today. We're forked in two directions. Both version of the language and implementation we've forked rather than rallying around a single solution. JavaScript, everyone uses Node.js. I've never heard of anyone JavaScript runs on the web browser in its implementation, but, but otherwise I've never heard of uh, someone not using Node.js. It is the PyPy of JavaScript. It is just in time compiled blazingly fast because of all the money that the um, browser companies have invested in the last 15 years on optimizing a dynamic language JavaScript. And finally, ES6, the new version of the language, uh, adds some new syntax and features so it's not 100% uh, compatible, but they have a cross-compiler. You can write the newest, most modern JavaScript code and then run it on Internet Explorer because ES6 can compile back to ES5. But you say, everyone will keep using Python. 
because it has reflection generators, iterators, classes, modules, and a whole other list of features. And JavaScript does not. Well, that was true last year, but it does now. ES6 came out, uh, I think, roughly within the last 12 months, which adds to JavaScript reflection generators, iterators, classes, and modules. I find that with the, the rate that the world is moving at, prejudices become harder and harder, harder to argue on behalf of because absolutely horrible languages and editors, you turn around and suddenly VI has syntax highlighting. <laughs> They told us Emacs people we were mad for using that much RAM and giving up performance to have syntax highlighting. And so we had a talking point for a while. You can use Emacs and have syntax highlighting. They took it away. And JavaScript has now taken that away because, and this is interesting, like I remember back in the old days, languages like didn't get features this fast, but it turns out the JavaScript people are not happy to have to live without all those wonderful features Python has. We knew they couldn't be happy without them. We thought they would all eventually give up and adopt Python. Instead, they just made their language a decent one, and now they can stay. <laughs> so this is really interesting that we keep seeing languages add the features of others. We were doing it, of course, uh, before many other languages were, adopting try finally from Java, uh, I think icon is what gave us list comprehensions, uh, indentation, uh, sensitivity from ABC. I mean, Python is mainly, with one exception, a large act of larceny, of great language features that had already proved themselves in other languages. Remember, Python's a boring technology. It adopts a feature once it has become proven in another language. Uh, and JavaScript has decided to go in the same directions. These languages are all becoming more similar to each other. Java now uses the Tim sort and has added recently a language feature directly from Python. Uh, it reminds me of anyone know whose uh, last book was titled, Everything That Rises Must Converge? Flannery O'Connor. I believe it was her last book of short stories. Uh, everything that rises must converge. I thought of that recently as I stepped back and noticed that a number of different languages are all moving towards having the same feature set eventually. I wonder if they'll all be, you know, look almost exactly the same at the end. Now I know, last ditch attempt here to get ourselves out of JavaScript. What about the fact that it's just dumb? <laughs> All right, this is famous. This is from a talk, Gary Bernhardt's wonderful talk called What? Uh, where he points out that in JavaScript, in its type system, this is specifically a criticism of its type system, if you take the integer 40, subtract the string 3, 0, you get the integer 10. Because of course that's what you would get if you subtract a string from an integer. Of course. So what happens if you get 40? and add the string 30. What? <laughs> In Python, a language that's usable, you are told immediately, and I say usable because in JavaScript, you make that mistake, and you're not told. It's 100 lines later when you get, you know, error, why is this none, or whatever, that you discover that somewhere in the previous 100 lines of code, you generated a value that wasn't exactly the one you expected, a string where you expected an integer or vice versa, and uh, they've decided to solve even that. At Dropbox, people don't, where I work, people don't write uh, plain JavaScript anymore. They write TypeScript, uh, which has most of the features of ES6, and type checking. You state, you know, like you're a C programmer or something, that this function returns a string, which means that bozo maneuver I just showed you becomes impossible. Uh, you're, you won't even be allowed to load and run or to compile the TypeScript code because it will notice that you've done something that is generating a different type or could generate a different type than you expect. The, instead of fixing the type system, which they really can't do at this point because it would break existing apps, they're instead fighting back successfully against the broken type system 
uh, with, uh, with a tried and true technique, static typing, bog simple, it's been around, I mean, they're, they're doing interesting things with it, like um, uh, type inferencing where they can and things like that, but uh, typing has been around since the 60s, it's well understood, and it solves a problem that they have. Oh, and you can cross-compile TypeScript to ES5 so that it runs in the browser. Once again, that backwards compatibility, that you're not losing the old language as you move forward. So it is a contender in the language wars. It is becoming a sophisticated, not, 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 like, not this minimal language that barely lets you write jQuery. It's now gaining the features of real production languages and becoming safer. And after all, what is its description on something like the Wikipedia? Dynamic, high level, and open source. That almost sounds familiar. So what will happen to Python? Well, I don't think this is a big deal because Python has always played second fiddle to some other web language, whether it was PHP, VBScript, Ruby, uh, remember that back in the 2000s, and uh, JavaScript today, there's really always been another language that has been the favorite among people who are web first, professional programmers second, whose main goal is just to write for the web. And if you're writing front end code in JavaScript or TypeScript all day, I can see why a small shop starting up, a startup that wants to succeed, a consultant that has to get a contract out, might just decide to write JavaScript on the back end and reuse the same knowledge that they learned uh, 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 in the browser in order to do their application code as well. That, to me, is an understandable trade-off. What are Python's advantages, then? Uh, what does it have uh, besides its famous simplicity and uh, its excellent type system that, uh, and, uh, that offer advantages? The big thing that Python's doing at the moment is it is becoming the world's default language. Science is moving to Python. Data is moving to Python. Uh, the people that do stock market analytics, they're split between R, and a lot of big data people are split between R and Python, but they're the two contenders at this point that have been left standing. Um, a friend that uh, does uh, weather prediction in Columbus, Ohio, uh, he is a consultancy that will tell you, you go to him, hey, we're going to be doing uh, investing in crops, and so we need this kind of data. He'll tell you which weather services give that data the most accurately. He is always churning yesterday's predictions by the weather service and weather.com against the real weather and knows where all the bodies are buried. He knows that the weather channel always overestimates the uh, chance of rain because no one ever complains because they did bring their umbrella. Uh, and he says that when he goes to weather conferences, there's now a Python track for people that haven't learned it yet. It, Python is often the language that you learn first in school. Its simple syntax is perfect for the occasional programmer. So many people in our world today, school teachers, scientists, are having to start programming, not because they ever signed up for or wanted to be a professional programmer, but because they have other things to do. They have other stuff they've got to get done, and they need a language which is simple because they're only going to use it every few weeks. They're never going to completely understand it. They need the error messages to be obvious and simple just to survive because they're not a professional. They don't get to spend all day, Monday through Friday, keeping their head filled with facts about their programming language. They need something simple just to survive. And, of course, Python has a burgeoning community. I had to zoom out quite a bit to get a, a fairly full list. This is the Django Girls website. They run weekend events where they teach women to write their first little website. This, uh, this is the events that are coming up from today through about six weeks from today around the world. I think if I can see the small print, uh, yeah, the, 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 the ones on, essentially, this is the rest of October, November, and the first day or two of December are a fit on the bottom there before I ran out of room. These are the number of, of just normal people that might never choose uh, programming as a profession, that are learning it because they're interested or it's a hobby or they think that in their other work they can accelerate what they do if they have a programming language they can use and they are coming to Python in droves. Professional programmers can survive JavaScript just fine. 
Yes, the type system's a bit broken. Yes, it has quirks. But even Python has quirks if you dig in deep enough and the professional programmer is gonna have to learn all the quirks and patterns of whatever language they choose. I know people that are happy writing C++ because they learned it all. They know it inside and out and have learned to keep it tame and to keep it operating. But the new programmer needs Python. They need that simplicity. Not like me because they're finicky, but could survive another language if they wanted, but because simplicity is absolutely essential to the person who's not a professional programmer and doesn't have all week to become an expert. The web and Python met back in the crazy 1990s when both were pretty immature and they both learned things. As we learned as a discipline, uh, programmers learned how to automate the web and as Python programmers uh, iterated on a number of different patterns and found good ones that you now see repeated over and over again. All forms libraries, for example, look somewhat the same. As we as a community learned the patterns that we could repeat in order to make the web possible to program for, maybe even sometimes a delight to program for. But even today, I would say, we are still learning. Even today, there are openings for new patterns, for us to learn new things about the web as it continues to expand and develop, and about our favorite programming language. Even after all these years, I don't think we even know what it is yet. Thank you very much.